Happy Wednesday. Yes, it is Wednesday, right? Okay. It's happy too. Um, yes, I've. Uh, anyway, um, welcome to the State Department. Uh, I don't have anything at the top, so Brad. Can we start off? Um, yesterday, you you said that the call between the secretary and the Russian foreign minister was uh, had just briefly ended, and you didn't have a full readout. Do you have a more uh, complete readout? today? I mean, I guess, uh, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, the call did take place yesterday. Uh, I mean, the focus was on, uh, uh, not surprisingly, how do we get uh, uh, past the current challenges in uh, our efforts with Russia to uh, coordinate uh, on a credible nationwide ceasefire, access to humanitarian assistance, and getting the Geneva talks back up and running. So, you know, we've been very clear about not getting too much into the details of what those remaining challenges are. The Secretary has uh, addressed this before, and uh, as, has, uh, as have we, myself, and John. Uh, but that was really the focus of the conversation, uh, was, you know, there, we continue to talk with Russia. Uh, we continue to work through uh, some of the issues that we have, uh, some of our concerns, and indeed they have concerns as well that they can speak to or not. Um, but that was the focus of the conversation. Yesterday you guys were a bit befuddled <laughs> by the – A bit. Befuddled, befuddled. confused um, <laughs> by the Russian decision to start undertaking missions from Iran. Uh, did you get clarity uh, from that? telephone call with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov about the intent and the purpose of the well, these I mean, missions? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, I mean, it was raised. I'm not going to necessarily get into the details of, uh, of uh, uh, what uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, said about it, uh, but you've seen uh, public remarks uh, uh, by Russia uh, as to why they're pursuing this uh, agreement or this arrangement with Iran. Um, you know, yesterday we said we're looking for uh, – uh, or we're looking at it. Uh, we're trying to get a better assessment of what's going on. But I stand by what I said yesterday, which is that fundamentally this isn't helpful. And it's not helpful because, uh, you know, it continues to complicate what is already a very dangerous situation in and around Aleppo when you have, you have Russia using uh, Iranian air bases uh, as a way to carry out uh, more intensive uh, – bombing runs that are hitting, uh, continue to hit, uh, civilian populations. Uh, and so uh, our concerns uh, remain very vivid and, uh, and uh, you know, we're uh, trying to remain focused on uh, specifically with Aleppo, but uh, on a broader scale, trying to get uh, a cessation of hostilities back uh, in place in Syria. and. This doesn't help it. But, you know, more broadly, Brad, um, you know, this is not – we understand the importance and the significance of them using Iranian, uh, Iranian air bases, but, you know, Iran – or uh, rather, Russia has been doing this kind of uh, – or been carrying out these kinds of airstrikes for months now. So that element of it is not new. The fact of the matter is it's only exacerbating what is already a very dangerous situation. Uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, spoke directly to you, Mr. Deputy Spokesman Toner, um, about your comment yesterday that uh, this use of Iranian – of an Iranian air base may have violated uh, the UNSCR 2231. Uh, what is your view uh, now that you guys have had another day of sure. assessment? Well, let me first uh, just qualify if it's up my view. We have lawyers who are looking at it um, and uh, trying to assess it, and they continue to do so. Uh, we don't – I don't have a definitive uh, assessment. I, I think they're looking at it. But regardless, uh, you know, um, you know, just to focus on process, I mean, for the Security Council to determine whether uh, an action is a violation of one of its sanctions, uh, it would need to, um, I think, agree to some kind of language. Uh, determining that a violation has occurred, and uh, all of any of that language, Russia would have a chance to make its case that it's not. I mean, we know how the Security Council works. 
Um, so so regardless the, of yeah. whether we or other members of the Security Council, the Permanent Five uh, members, uh, raise concerns or raise uh, uh, concerns that this might be a violation, Russia will have ample opportunity to make its case that it's not. That has no bearing on whether you consider it a violation. You know, Agreed. when there's Agreed. been many cases I agree with only that. at Iran with ballistic missiles where you insist that it is your view that it is a violation. I agree. Do you I'm just say saying that, that, that in this case, do you view we it? We just as haven't a reached that assessment yet. Okay. I just have one or two yeah, more sure. on this Go ahead, on Syria. Yep. Um, the Secretary General of the UN warned that uh, Aleppo could become a catastrophe. I, I think he's used this language a lot of times before, but regardless, um, he called specifically on the U.S. and Russia to uh, agree on this ceasefire as soon as possible. Um, what's the holdup? Well, we want to get there. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, uh, conceding to uh, uh, a bad arrangement. Uh, we have certain uh, issues that we want resolved before uh, we can enter into that kind of coordination uh, mechanism with Russia. We've been very clear about that. We believe we can get there and we continue to work at it. But to speak to um, uh, UN Secretary General's comments, uh, you're right. Um, he said it before, and we said it before. We need full humanitarian access immediately, yesterday, two days ago, a week ago, and we don't have it. Uh, you know, what we've seen are half steps and half measures uh, by Russia, uh, opening three hour corridors or three hour windows where uh, humanitarian assistance can be delivered, that frankly, the UN has said, doesn't work. Uh, so uh, we are equally alarmed by the worsening situation in Aleppo. I don't think anybody can cannot be. Uh, and we need to, uh, and we want to get to a place where we can get uh, the, the violence in and around Aleppo to cease. My very last Please. one. Yeah, um, are you open to a ceasefire with Russia that doesn't include all this stuff about military coordination, military partnership? Well, um, so that, that's people, a, people will die yeah. in the meantime. No, I understand what you're saying. I, I think I understand what you're saying. I think, I mean, we've done this before where we've looked at uh, pauses or whatever, we, however they're, you know, uh, referred to or characterized as. I think that's always on the table. If we can get uh, some kind of uh, preliminary pause before we reach uh, uh, a broader agreement uh, or a way forward on coordinating, uh, of course we pursue that. Follow up. Okay. How is how is the uh, this bombardment from the base in Iran violates two two three one? How is it violated? In what sense? Well, again, I don't want to get into. I, I, my understanding yeah. is that you know that involves deliveries of arms to Iran, you know, in the, or, or or weapons and so on. Yeah, Can I mean, it's it's a bit more it's a bit more nuanced and complicated right, than okay. that, and I I understand your you know. I don't have the language in front of me, but it's a bit more nuanced and complicated. It involves uh, sometimes uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, certain uh, weaponry or, or uh, uh, to be used uh, or housed in Iran. Uh, I, I, again, I don't have the language in front of me, but it's, it's very nuanced and it's very complex, which is why I just told Brad, we're looking at it, we're assessing it, and we're assessing whether this would constitute a violation. And if we do so, and there's a process in place that we would take it to the UN Security Council, and then that process would uh, play itself out where every member of the UN Security Council would be able to weigh in whether they agree with that or not. So we're just not so, there yet. But as long as it is not an Iranian hand or Iranian position, it is not a violation, is it? I, I'm sorry, one more time the question. Uh, my, my question is, as long as, you know, the Russians obviously control all these airplanes and they probably control the the area from which they bomb and so on, you know, as long as it is not in, in Iranian hands, is it a violation? I'm trying to understand. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. It's, as I said, I, I just don't have, um, I, I think that's what we're looking at right now, and our lawyers are looking at it. We have made an assessment. We're looking at it, um, you know, and it, it does require a very uh, uh, detailed legal analysis, whether there was a violation. And again, it's not just as I understand it, it's not just supplying the Iranians uh, certain weapons or certain offensive weaponry. Uh, it's more complex than that, whether you're uh, using it. Uh, you know, I can get you the language. I mean, you have it in front of you, no doubt. But uh, And my last question is, why do you think, in your view or your assessment, why do the Russians, uh, why are they using an Iranian base 
when in fact they have the Hamaymiya, uh, that is housing, you know, many airplanes, uh, and they can bomb from there. Is, is there a political message? Is it really a solidification no, you know, of there's, this Iranian-Russian sure. alliance? Or? The short answer, Said, is I don't know, and we don't know. Um, you know, the, we've seen um, Russian politicians uh, and officials say that this is part of a cost-saving measure that allows them uh, to, uh, you know, to move closer to the attack. That's really for them to uh, try to characterize what their intentions are here. Um, again, I would just go back to what I, was, I said in response to Brad's question. You know, the Russians have been using their bases in Syria to carry out similar attacks for months now. Um, and so, while I don't want to in any way uh, underplay the uh, significance of them using Iranian air bases as they are, uh, I would just – I think it's important to remember that uh, they've been carrying out similar airstrikes that have purported to target uh, Daesh and ISIL, but in a large number of cases uh, hit indiscriminately civilian targets. Uh, civilian uh, – civilians themselves, as well as, we talked about yesterday, moderate Syrian opposition groups, all of which only complicates and exacerbates an already difficult situation and leaves us uh, nowhere closer to what we need to get in place in Syria. On well, this question? I, well, I, okay. I had one quick one. Yeah. Yeah. Just following up on – Let's get it out of the way, then. <laughs> – where uh, – sure. Brad was asking yesterday yeah. is, have you considered any further how – uh, this arrangement, Russian arrangement with Iran, will affect any potential military cooperation with Russia. I mean, is this something you can truly engage in if, uh, if they are in fact cooperating with Iran? Well, at such I, I mean, level? again, I would just pivot back to what I said before, which is that, you know, um, so Russia and Iran are both members of the ISSG, this International Syria Support Group. They're also and it's no surprise to anyone, we've all known that they've been longtime supporters of Assad and the regime. Uh, heck, Iran's been, you know, active on the ground, uh, troops on the ground in Iran – or in Syria, rather, uh, for a long time. Um, so, again, I don't want to – For all those reasons, why would you cooperate with Russia militarily? Well, I think, again, part of the operating assumption with the ISSG is that you bring all uh, the, quote-unquote, stakeholders uh, – uh, with regard to Syria in the same room and you try to reach a consensus on a way forward. Everyone who has signed up to the ISSG has at least uh, claimed to support a political solution and a peaceful solution to the conflict in Syria. Now, every, now many of the countries who sit on the ISSG have their own motives and their own uh, uh, um, positions on their way to get there. But that's part of what we're trying to do here through diplomacy is reach consensus and then move forward with that. That's all we can do right now. That's the mechanism we have in front of us. And so ultimately, and we've talked about this, if Iran and Russia continually prove uh, or continually uh, – uh, continue, rather, to uh, disregard uh, those efforts, then I think at some point we have to reach a different assessment. But at this point, we're not ready to go there yet. Mark, uh, please, Mr. Uh, issue. Uh, Russian military spokesperson has said today uh, or has asked the State Department to check the content of UN Resolution 2231. And he, he said, we suggest the, representative of, the representatives of the State Department get out their pencils and trace the lines on the map to discover the fact that Syria is a separate sovereign state. Do you have any comment on that? I saw the quote, actually, and I would just – for the record, I would remind them that my name is Mark Toner, not Michael Toner. Uh, <laughs> maybe it was just a bad translation. I don't know. Um, if what you're asking me, Michelle, is whether we have uh, – what specifically are, is the question for, for us to answer is whether we uh, – Both we're to, to check the content of the UN Resolution 2231 and uh, then that Syria is a separate sovereign country. Well, I think the assertion is – and I, I, I – you know um, – uh, I hate to parse uh, uh, a Russian official's uh, language, but um, but I think the assertion there is that we're somehow carrying out military strikes in a sovereign nation that we don't have its approval. Is that the, is that the point? Because if that's so, we've been very clear that we believe that we have the authorization 
the legal authority, rather, uh, to use military force against ISIL uh, in Iraq and in Syria. I think he, he means that uh, that Russia didn't break the uh, UN resolution 2231. I think he made. I think he was making two points with that. And uh, look, I mean, with regard to the UN Security Council resolution 2231, we're assessing it. It's very complicated. It, it is not clear cut in the sense of they're not that it, 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 that it, it prohibits providing Iran with uh, offensive weaponry. Uh, it, it has gradations, if you will, uh, on. Uh, what you can or cannot do with regard to uh, providing or giving uh, Iran um, uh, offensive capabilities. Uh, and so we're looking at it, and we're trying to make a sober assessment of whether this constitutes, in our view, a violation. We're not there yet. So I would just, uh, you know, ask everyone to be patient, and uh, once we do reach a, a, an assessment of whether it is or isn't, uh, then we'll let you know. And what about the other point, Syria as a sovereign country? Well, that's it. I was trying to answer that. I said we've we've to, we've been through this before, where you know the accusation is that we're somehow operating outside the, the bounds of international law. Uh, we uh, disagree. Uh, we are operating both in uh, uh, our own national security interests, but also in the region's security interest, in trying to uh, carry out strikes against Daesh and against ISIL. Frankly, uh, the regime uh, thus far has been incapable of uh, going after and handling uh, this threat to their own national security uh, thus far. And, uh, you know, in fact, we've seen the regime, as much as they purport to be, uh, you know, uh, full-throatedly and wholeheartedly going after ISIL and Daesh, you know, we've seen that they collaborate uh, when it's in their interest to do so. My last question yeah, on Syria. Uh, Iranian Parliament Speaker Ali Larijani has denied today reports that Iran has made uh, uh, a military base available for the Russian forces. Uh, and he uh, said that uh, Iran has not made any base available for the Russians. The Russians have confirmed the use of uh, Iran military base, air base. Uh, who should we believe? <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, Michelle, you know, that's for the uh, – that's for them to work out between themselves. Um, you know, if there's confusion or disconnect there, uh, we certainly wouldn't speak to it. But do you have any confirmation that the Russians are using military air bases? In, uh, I mean, you know, Iran? we've talked about, you know, our assessment, and they've, through the memorandum of understanding, asked, uh, uh, as we talked about yesterday, asked for us for overflight uh, for Iraq. Uh, I'm not going to get into any more details that we might have that they are using Iranian air bases, but they have spoken to it. They have confirmed that they are doing so. Uh, the Iranians seem to differ, but I can't make that determination here. Okay. Do you have any response to the um, Iraqi Prime Minister granting permission to Russia to allow – to fly over Iraqi airspace? You had, I believe, mentioned yesterday – No, I did. did. No, I, I mean, look, we've – you know, we're in constant uh, contact and dialogue with uh, the Iraqi government and the Iraqi uh, leadership. Um, but ultimately, they're a sovereign country, and they make their own decisions, and I wouldn't attempt to speak to them. Sure. Uh, so uh, Prime Minister Abadi uh, has said a few things, like, uh, uh, about the, the operation in Mosul. Uh, once he's, he seems to be concerned that the Peshmerga might uh, take more territory from Mosul, he says uh, the Peshmerga, quote-unquote, shouldn't pursue an uh, uh, ambitionist expansion exp – expansionist ambitions. What do you, what do well, you make of that? Um, I would just say that we engage regularly um, with the Kurdistan regional government and Baghdad uh, to advocate and encourage uh, a unified front uh, in the face of the continuing threat of uh, Daesh or ISIL. Um, and in fact, we hold and have held joint planning sessions between the Iraqi Kurdistan regional uh, President Barzani and the National Security Advisor uh, for the government of Iraq. Uh, and uh, I think. Uh, one took place last week. Uh, it was the second, I believe, of these meetings. And the intent here of those meetings is to um, try to build that kind of partnership and to work through some of the challenges as uh, Iraqi forces writ large look towards uh, the liberation of Mosul.
He's also said that no force, I'm, I'm quoting him, yeah. other than the ISF is allowed to enter Mosul City, meaning that the Kashmaga is not, not allowed to enter Mosul City. Is that the understanding the United States has that uh, the Kurds shouldn't be allowed to enter the city? Well, again, I, I think that there just needs to be closer coordination between, uh, and we've encouraged that, and indeed it, it, it has taken place. Uh, thus far, there have been these meetings. As, uh, as they look towards Mosul and, frankly, uh, the next steps in liberating Iraq from ISIL. I, I think it's absolutely important, and we've emphasized this all along, that uh, the Peshmerga and all of the various uh, fighting groups in Iraq need to be under the command and control of the Iraqi government and the Iraqi military. Um, that's been our assessment all along. There needs to be that coordination mechanism. But we certainly recognize, and we've said so many times, the vital role that uh, that these groups, including the Peshmerga, play uh, and have played thus far and showed tremendous courage in liberating uh, parts of Iraq that have been under the control of ISIL. So I think what we're talking about is better coordination, better communication between uh, uh, the Kurdish, uh, Kurdish forces and the uh, Iraqi government uh, military. Are you, are you expecting to achieve that better coordination, better we think we're on the road there. Yes. before the, oper the actual operation begins on the city? We, as I said, we've had this, uh, these two joint meetings. Uh, we expect that coordination to continue. Uh, and uh, through that mechanism, we hope to address all these issues. Russia. Um, the question arose yesterday about whether Moscow intended a longer-term presence in Iran, and that we discussed that, and you didn't quite, you know, we're uncertain. And what I understand since is, is that, that Hamadan Air Base has been enhanced and expanded specifically for Russian use, including building four long-range, uh, uh, long runways for the Russian bombers. And that, of course, took some months and speaks to planning for a significant longer-term presence. So, series of questions. One, is that your view? And two, in yesterday's raids, what did Russia attack? Did it attack dash targets, or did it attack the civilians and moderate rebels, as the U.S. has complained before? So, uh, in response to the first question, which I think is, what's Russia's long-term plans uh, with Iran, or whether we have, whether this was a long-term planned operation? I'm not sure. Well, do, do you have more info? I have more information, so maybe you do <laughs> as well. That the Hamadan Air Base, which Russia is using in mm -hmm. Iran was expanded and developed specifically for the use of these TU-22 bombers. And that work, the enhancement and development, including the longer runways, speaks to a, an intent for some longer-term presence and not simply, you know, an occasional flight out of that air base. Is that your view as well? Again, I wouldn't necessarily uh, respond to that. Um, I, I don't have that level of detail, frankly. Um, but I think that's a question for the Russians and the Iranians to answer. Now, your second question was, what was hit yesterday? Um, I, I think I spoke to this yesterday, but uh, I'll repeat that. Um, as per usual, there were uh, ISIL uh, targets hit. But as per usual, there were also civilian targets and uh, – and uh, also uh, opposition, moderate opposition targets also hit. And again, that is uh, indicative of a pattern that we've seen. Did you say which was targeted more? I can't. I don't have that kind of breakdown. Okay. Uh, are we done with Syria or the region? Let's finish and I'll get to you, I promise. Yeah. Please. Go ahead and back. Or Turkey? Wait. I'm Turkey. Sorry, where are we? Are we done with Syria? Yes. yes. Syria? Yeah. One more Syria, then Turkey, and then oh. Afghanistan. The head of Kurdish National Council in Syria, Ibrahim Biro, was kidnapped last weekend by the PYD forces. And later on, he was yeah. forced to leave the country, and now he's in Iraq. I was wondering if you're following the I don't. Case. I, I, I'm aware of reports of the case. I just don't have any more detail for you. I apologize. Please. Thank you, uh, Just yesterday, uh, Özgür Gündem newspaper, uh, pro-Kurdish newspaper building was uh, uh, sealed, and the newspaper uh, is shut down, and about 14 journalists, maybe more, uh, detained just yesterday. So it's almost 100 journalists right now in Turkey sitting in the jails. 
and there are dozens of others also on detainment list. I was wondering if you have any comments on this. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I think you, we are always concerned, and we've been very uh, clear about that whenever we see uh, an independent media outlet um, uh, shut down. Um, you know, uh, I think that we uh, would encourage uh, Turkey as it uh, takes these kind of steps uh, in the security realm uh, to be mindful of the impact that uh, that kind of action would have on uh, its democratic institutions, one of which is a free and independent media. Please. There's fighting going on between different factions of the Taliban. After U.S. drone strike killed Taliban leader Akhtar Mansour in May, two factions emerged, one more hardline than the other. We're now learning that the Taliban cracked further and a third splinter group emerged. How does this affect reconciliation prospects, if that is still the goal? Well, I think it is, and we've said all along that this needs to be an Afghan-led, Afghan-owned uh, process. Um, I mean, uh, anytime you've got various splinter groups uh, emerging, that does make those efforts more complex, uh, but that remains our overarching goal and what we view as uh, really the long-term solution uh, for uh, Afghanistan to achieve uh, peace and stability. Um, but I, I don't have an assessment of what that latest development might mean uh, for prospects, but we continue to encourage those efforts. Um, you know, I think that uh, that said, um, you know, it has been a difficult fighting season in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, we've seen Afghan uh, security forces thus far meet the challenge. Uh, but it's also important to remember that uh, they're still under threat. There's still a high level of violence, and that a large number of Taliban groups um, and factions uh, continue to uh, press the fight, and we need to continue our support uh, to the Afghan military. Why do you think the freshening is going to make uh, make it more complex reconciliation? Well, again, I just I mean we could all uh, provide our armchair assessment, but anytime you've got a splintering of uh, of uh, of, uh, of a group, uh, then you know it's harder to get consensus. Uh, do you hope I have two more? Please go I have two more. Yeah, go uh, do you hope as different Taliban factions fight each other, Taliban as a whole will get weaker? Uh, Again, I, I think, frankly, our, you know, I mean, anything that would weaken their um, their ability to cause harm to innocent Afghan uh, civilians, uh, we would welcome. But I think what our preference would be would be that uh, these various uh, or some in the uh, Taliban leadership would recognize that there is no long-term uh, military solution to what they're pursuing in. Afghanistan would lay down their arms, would adopt the Constitution, accept it, uh, and uh, agree to sit down, as I said, in a, as part of an Afghan-owned and Afghan-led uh, peace process. One more. Please. Are you concerned that ISIL may be taking advantage of the fractioning among the Taliban? Uh, earlier this August, an Afghan general said over the past two months the Taliban had stopped fighting ISIL. Afghan officials are worried that the Taliban might be forging an informal alliance with ISIL in eastern Afghanistan. What is your assessment? Well, I think, uh, you know, our assessment is that we continue to see, um, we've talked about affiliates, uh, uh, different groups affiliating themselves with ISIL, uh, but we've continued to see an effort on the part of ISIL. Um, we've seen it in, in Libya and elsewhere, frankly, um, for it to expand or to uh, reach out its tendrils, if you will. Uh, into different places that are ungoverned spaces, and certainly that's true for Afghanistan. Uh, so we're monitoring the presence of ISIL-affiliated groups uh, very closely in Afghanistan. We're actively engaged with the government of Afghanistan uh, and our partners in the region uh, uh, to prevent that from taking place. Um, we don't want to see them uh, gain safe haven or material support uh, from the Taliban or anyone. Yeah, let's do Goyal and then you. I'm sorry, Libby. Mark, uh, the innocent people are the victims of these terrorist terrorism in Afghanistan, and what they're asking now, after so many years, they have not seen or had a good night's sleep because of these terrorist activities. 
What they are asking is from the United States and the international community when there will be a light in the dark, uh, uh, in their life, when they will have a night, good night's sleep. And well, what's the message for, uh, for those innocent people? Well, I, look, I, I, I mean, what is the future of Afghanistan? Uh, as well, we're trying to, so uh, let me just say, the United States uh, has made a long-term commitment to Afghanistan. Um, and we're going to help Afghanistan build a more stable, peaceful, democratic, and, demo and uh, prosperous future. Uh, you know, we have uh, sacrificed uh, uh, in both blood and treasure uh, to make that happen, and we're going to continue uh, to fulfill that uh, commitment. And we stand firmly behind the democratically elected government. Uh, we commend uh, President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah on the progress they've made in uh, 18 months into a five-year term but we want to continue to build on that progress. We want to work to increase the capability of Afghan security forces uh, to provide for the security uh, of the Afghan people. But it is a long, difficult road, uh, but we're certainly not going to abandon it. One more just Please, general, question, general question, and that is that uh, uh, dozens of nations are fighting against these terrorists, uh, ISIL, Taib Taliban, or ISIS, and all among uh, others. Uh, my question is, have you and they have no basis, they, have no, they are not nations or countries. Have you reached those who are financing them and arming them? Because we are, without financing or arming, they cannot fight. It's absolutely a challenge. Uh, we've seen it most recently with uh, Daesh or ISIL in Syria and Iraq. Uh, terrorist financing uh, is a huge piece of solving the overall challenge of terrorism because, as you note, uh, they need to have access to funds in order to operate. Uh, we've focused on that, and we've made, frankly, great strides in choking off ISIL's access to those funds. Uh, we did similarly uh, well in cutting off al-Qaeda's access to funds, but it remains a challenge. Please, Ali. Uh, the unity government, the differences within unity government now has come out in the open. To what extent this is affecting uh, the war against Taliban in Afghanistan? Well, I mean, look, uh, you're talking about Afghanistan, of course. Um, uh, you know, we've seen uh, Chief Executive Abdullah's uh, public remarks regarding President Ghani and uh, the government of national unity, which is what I think you're referring to. Uh, we remain supportive, as I just said, of a government of national unity. We encourage the President, both President Ghani, rather, and Chief Executive Abdullah to work together to pursue common goals, which is a prosperous, stable Afghanistan. Uh, we regularly consult with, um, with both of them. President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah and their key advisors uh, as we work, as they work rather, to implement what is uh, a very difficult and ambitious domestic reform agenda, and we're going to continue that support. The Unity Government, you know, was formed as a result of Secretary Kerry's trip to Afghanistan and his negotiations with these two leaders. Is he worried about uh, such a scenario coming up two, nearly two years after the formation of the government? And is he making any effort to reach out to these two leaders? Uh, well, I mean, as I just said, you know, we, uh, we uh, remain in very close uh, touch with uh, both leaders, um, uh, both through our embassy, but also uh, from Washington as well. Um, you know, I think our assessment is, as I just said, that they've got significant challenges facing them. Um, but we stand by and ready to support them as they work through these challenges. Uh, we want to see them implement, as I said, a, what is an ambitious reform agenda. Um, but uh, we continue to consult with them and their advisors, uh, and we believe that uh, they understand the importance of them working together rather separately than separately. North Korea. North Korea. Um, Let's close out that? Afghanistan. Just uh, again, how concerned are you about ISIL taking advantage of? Taliban. Well, I think I answered this. I mean, look, we're always looking at uh, ISIL's ability to uh, uh, find safe haven and then uh, expand to work with, uh, as I said, these affiliate groups, uh, uh, factions of, uh, uh, of groups uh, such as the Taliban that they might uh, uh, be able to uh, exploit. And uh, we're monitoring it very closely. We're in close uh, contact and uh, coordination with the Afghan uh, security forces in that regard. And uh, we're going to continue 
uh, as we said before, if we uh, see opportunities to uh, take out key leadership, we're going to strike. Please. Well, no, no, come on, please. I'm sorry. Uh, when um, after the killing of the Taliban leader Mansoor, <laughs> President Obama said it was an important milestone in our long-standing effort to bring peace and prosperity to Af Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, do you do you still think of it as 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 a milestone? With, uh, did you did you I'm sorry did, did you expect the fracturing of the Taliban with the removal of of the leader? I think what we said at the time, and what I would still contend is that uh, it was uh, a uh, a strike to take out the leader of an organization that was intent on carrying out uh, acts of terror on both the Afghan people and, frankly, international forces. Uh, 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 that were uh, resident in uh, Afghanistan, and we took that opportunity. Uh, but we also took that opportunity to send a clear message that uh, the Taliban needs to uh, recognize that it has no future in fighting and that it should uh, uh, seek, uh, uh, seek uh, talks with the Afghan government. As I said, Afghan-owned, Afghan-led process, it has to be. Uh, but uh, I think those are the were the goals of that uh, carrying out that strike, and we stand by them. Please, okay. uh, North Korea's atomic energy agency, in a written response to the Kyoto News Service, confirmed what the intelligence community and the IAEA have been indicating that there's been a resumption of plutonium reprocessing at the Yongbyon facility in their. Uh, comment. They also hinted at a coming fifth nuclear test, while the uh, foreign ministry in Pyongyang today issued fresh threats against U.S. bases in the Pacific. Uh, sanctions don't appear to be deterring the North Koreans. Uh, what is the United States contemplating to try to uh, mitigate uh, North Korean uh, behavior in violation of all these U.N. sanctions? Well, we're certainly aware of the uh, reports regarding resumed plutonium production. Um, you know, if these reports are correct, uh, it is obviously a clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions which prohibit such activities. Um, I would say these actions only uh, serve to increase the international community's resolve to uh, continue to counter the DPRK's, North Korea's prohibited activities, and that as you noted, continue, or, uh, includes implementing existing UN Security Council sanctions. Um, our commitment to the defense of our allies in the region, and that includes the Republic of uh, Korea as well as Japan, remains ironclad. Uh, we also remain prepared to defend ourselves as well as our allies. And we call on North Korea once again to refrain from actions that only raise tensions in the region. Uh, and focus instead on taking concrete steps that uh, will fulfill its international obligations. Um, you know, as to next steps or additional steps we might take, I don't have anything to preview right now. Uh, we continue to evaluate our options. But again, our focus has been thus far on, you know, getting these hard-hitting sanctions that we were managed to get uh, passed uh, uh, through the UN Security Council uh, fully implemented, and that involves uh, working with our regional partners uh, to uh, implement that, those sanctions to the fullest extent. Uh, related to that, any comment on the, the North Korean uh, diplomat who has uh, defected to South Korea? I don't really have any comments specifically to the case. I mean, we obviously urge all countries uh, to cooperate in the protection of North Korean refugees and asylum seekers within their territories. Um, we remain deeply concerned about the human rights situation in North Korea and the treatment of North Korean refugees and asylum seekers. And we're going to continue to work with countries, uh, other countries rather, and international organizations. That includes the UN Human Rights Council and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees to protect North Koreans, North Korean refugees, uh, as well as finding uh, long-term solutions for their plight. A different topic. Okay, I'll get yeah, one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and uh, you said that this is in intelligence information, but uh, do you have any information on the North Korea preparing for the fifth nuclear test? 
I, I don't have any information to share with you uh, on that specific threat. Uh, you know, we've, except to say that we've seen a pattern, uh, obviously, over the past uh, six months or so uh, that is deeply concerning. And we've taken steps to try to address that. We can, we're going to continue to evaluate our options going forward. Please. Um, okay. uh, was there any discussion formal in, or informal about Secretary Clinton using wireless earpiece or Bluetooth while she was here? And sure. also, uh, what ahead, is the State Department's policy on this technology? Answer. Um, so thanks for bringing that up because I did, uh, as I did promise yesterday, we did look into uh, those two issues. Uh, so. Um, we did, uh, we did have internal discussions, and I can say that State Department officials do not recall any discussions about the feasibility of then-Secretary Clinton potentially using a wireless earpiece or Bluetooth-enabled device uh, within the confines of Mahogany Row or the seventh floor. Um, and in answer to your second question, or maybe it was your first, I apologize, but uh, given the potential security vulnerabilities of that type of technology, uh, the department would not and does not approve uh, of the use of such devices in a secure space. Okay. Well, was she asked? Was she so she asked? Or you? Or you we said, said we don't recall any. You don't There was no discussions of it. I that, sorry, that was a roundabout way of saying we don't. There was no discussions about it. It was not raised. But well, was she doing it? Uh, I don't floor. believe so. I mean, I think we said <laughs> that. Uh, frankly, I don't have a a direct answer to that. I mean, I don't think she was. Uh, I mean, we don't, as I said, what we were asked about was whether we had pursued any uh, request uh, to use that kind of technology, and no one recalls that ever being raised, and in fact, we would not allow it. So the answer to it, the answer to that is no. Um, do you have more on this? No, don't. I was going to ask about. Um, I just want to know if you 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 put your, your answer. You referenced seventh floor mahogany row. Neither yesterday or today's question mentioned that. Is that a blanket statement? Period. This was never discussed, or was never discussed. I was only with talking about so it's secure spaces. Floor. And what I was talking about. I'm sorry if I was unclear about that. Mahogany row is a secure space. That's what I was trying to. Not necessarily the whole seventh floor, so but it was just never discussed. It was never discussed. Can I? Okay. That's according to our. Again, we we did ask all the people who were would have been knowledgeable of this. I wanted to ask about Rio. Uh, there are two, um, the, the American swimmers there have come, run into some problems with this report from Ryan Lochte about a, a robbery, and that's obviously been drawn into question. And now a judge in Rio has ordered that passports be seized, and that Ryan and another swimmer, at least one other swimmer, the, the judge said, cannot leave the country. We know that Ryan has already left the country, but the three other swimmers who we're with them that night. We don't believe have. We're not sure. Sure. What is going on? Is there some sort of international incident boiling up here? What is going on? What What are you hearing from your sure. Brazilian counterparts? Um, well, um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have Privacy Act waivers for any of these individuals uh, uh, who were involved in this incident. Uh, we've all seen the media reports, as you note that a Brazilian court has issued an order to seize the passports of several U.S. athletes who were involved in uh, this incident the other day. Uh, I have to refer you to the parties involved uh, for further information uh, because we don't have a Privacy Act waiver. I would note more broadly, though, that we encourage all parties uh, to work with Brazilian law enforcement uh, in their investigation of the incident, uh, but I'd refer you to those Brazilian authorities for any more information about the does, case. Does that mean you would, I mean, this may be far-fetched, but would you want Ryan Lockley to go back to Rio then if you're encouraging him to work with uh, Brazilian I mean, authorities? ultimately that's all for uh, an American citizen. We would never uh, obviously require any American citizen to comply with those kinds of requests. I think I'll stay where I was, which is that we would urge uh, or we would like to see and encourage American citizens to do what they can to uh, work with Brazilian authorities to close out this investigation. And are you working with, can you say the State Department is I can't. With the I apologize. Police? I just can't. Um, one more about the yeah, sure. Go ahead. We'll close um, this out. Being Please. that you're encouraging um, U.S. citizens to work with law enforcement in Brazil, is there any concern um, about the way U.S. citizens are being handled during the course of the Olympic Games by the Brazilian government or by the Brazilian law enforcement? 
I mean, we've talked a lot in the run-up to the games about providing uh, through an, a range of uh, sources uh, information to the multitude of Americans who are uh, on the ground right now in Rio and in Brazil. Um, thus far, I'm not aware of any uh, pattern of any kind of harassment or anything at all, frankly, uh, in terms of crime. I'd have to obviously consult with our embassy in Rio, uh, uh, in Brazil rather, to, uh, to get more information about that. But uh, uh, thus far, I don't think we've had seen any concerns uh, whatsoever about the security situation. Other than that, there have been several incidents, of which this is one, that have been reported. Uh, but I think, you know, in any event, uh, on the scale of the Olympics with the uh, – uh, um, the number of visiting tourists uh, uh, who are taking part in that event, uh, that's always something uh, that's a matter of concern. We always, uh, you know, urge uh, American travelers to be mindful of uh, security surrounding a big event, whether it's the Olympics or whatever uh, event uh, that takes place around the world. And to respect the laws. And of course to respect the laws, laws and rules of the, of the government, or of the country in, in which they are. Can I ask on emails? Yeah. Um, uh, Sorry, I've already been to you, so I'll get back to you, I promise, and then we'll do emails. So you, you mentioned yesterday that you were working to come up with a production schedule. You might present the production schedule on the email in, a, in an August 22nd court date. Do you have anything further on that, whether I, I you don't. have a production schedule or whether it would be in the public interest to at least produce these emails before uh, Election Day? Uh, I, I don't have any, uh, you know, as I said, we'll, uh, we're looking at it, uh, we're assessing the number and, and how we, uh, how we um, might share them. I, I, I think I confirmed yesterday uh, that we would uh, um, obviously uh, um, uh, hand them over to uh, Judicial Watch, uh, any of the emails uh, in addition that we'll receive are sent by uh, Secretary Clinton in her official capacity. Uh, as Secretary of State, uh, which were contained in the material that was handed over to us by the FBI. Um, but I don't have any additional details to provide on how that production schedule uh, would take place. But are you looking at Election Day as a deadline? I mean, do you think that would be in the public interest to have these emails out there before then? Frankly, uh, you know, and having dealt with uh, the tremendous amount of uh, emails that we uh, had to deal with, in responding to the previous FOIA request, uh, some 55,000, you know, it's always been uh, our goal is to work through as quickly and as expeditiously as possible, uh, but mindful of uh, the fact that we need to work uh, to address interagency concerns and possible uh, classification upgrades, that we're always working to produce these documents as quickly as possible. Sure. As you put it. Does that mean you've counted how many there are? And can you share that? I don't have a firm number for you. you, you can't I'm sorry, I, I don't. Uh, yeah, okay. We'll see if we have, if we can get that for you, okay? Yeah. Um, or how many pages of emails? Comey described it as several thousand. Is that is that what you assessed? Uh, so I don't want to, I, I don't want to give a wrong number. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. You got a number there, though. No, I don't. It's okay. like, it can come up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always seeking to answer your questions, Justin. Yeah. Trust me. Very quick question on the Palestinian Israeli okay. issue. Today, the Israeli radio said that the Prime Minister's office, Prime Minister Netanyahu's office, was getting ready or preparing some sort of response for a, an equivalent or a, a ultimately a, a, some sort of a a suggestion by the President of the United States on the two-state solution that may come up at the Security Council. Do you have any, first of all, have you heard the report? I'm not aware of any plans. I've seen the no, reports. I, I'm sure. not aware of any plans for a speech, uh, you know. Um, not, not a speech. Now they're saying that it's going to be uh, like a draft proposal at the United Nations Security Council. Are you aware of that? Uh, um, uh, I'm, again, I'm aware of the re reports that you're referring to. I'm not aware of any um, any intention to again to uh, to roll out some kind of new plan or strategy. Um, you know, but that said, uh, we continue to focus on efforts to uh, uh, to achieve a two-state solution. We believe it's absolutely vital vital to the uh, future of the region, and including working with the French 
on, on this thing, the French proposal. Including working with the French. Um, we continue to look at the French proposal and to talk to them about it. Okay. Sure. And then I'll get um, I wanted to ask about the hunt for Joseph Kony. Ugandan army has played a, an important part and role in uh, reducing the scope of uh, Kony's LRA organization, but this week there were reports that they were withdrawing. Can you clarify whether they are indeed withdrawing and whether the U.S. is engaged in negotiations to keep them for a bit longer? Sure. Um, well, we are, I can confirm, we're working closely with the Ugandan military and other uh, contributors to the African Union uh, Regional Task Force to ensure uh, a successful completion of their mission. Uh, and I can say the Ugandan military's long commitment to countering the Lord's Resistance uh, Army has resulted in improved security for the people of Uganda. Uh, in collaboration with the African Union and the United Nations, uh, the United States continues to support the efforts of the countries in the regions to combat uh, the threat and end the threat posed by the Lord's Resistance uh, Army and bring the remaining LRA leaders to justice. Um, I can say that over the past four years, uh, the Ugandan military uh, has removed four, I think, of LRA's uh, top five most senior and notorious commanders uh, from the battlefield. Um, so they have done tremendous work, uh, uh, and we want to see those efforts continue. So you're still in negotiations about whether they remain? Well, I, I just think uh, I don't want to uh, talk about our consultations and, uh, and discussions with uh, the Ugandan military, just to say that we continue our collaboration and we want to see a successful completion of the mission. Um, and just as a follow-up to that, sure. uh, the LRA crisis tracker, which looks at detailed data, suggests that uh, Joseph Kony's group has begun to abduct individuals again. Um, and some groups, are, the Enough Project in particular, is concerned that this could lead to, uh, you know, the LRA becoming powerful again in the region. Um, do you have any words of reassurance in, in that regard? Well, I would just say that our overarching strategy uh, focuses on the protection of the civilian population. Um, and it's also, frankly, focused on uh, apprehending or removing uh, Joseph Kony uh, and as well as other remaining L senior LRA commanders uh, from the battlefield. Uh, but we're going to continue to uh, pursue those objectives. Um, you know, it's all about fundamentally, as you note, uh, providing for the security of the people who are affected by this group. Uh, uh, we. Uh, without speaking to necessarily whether we've seen an uptick in kidnappings or other uh, efforts to uh, intimidate the local populations, um, you know, we're going to continue to collaborate, as I said, with and cooperate with uh, the security forces uh, that make up this regional task force. Uh, we have had, uh, we have seen success thus far, uh, but the mission is not complete yet. Um, so, Sudan? Yeah, please. The UN said today that the results of the initial fact-finding mission by the UN mission in Juba, or the in initial fact-finding investigation by the UN mission in Juba um, into the attack on the train apartments, that's expected to be turned over to the UN this week. Um, but after the announcement of the special investigation by the Secretary General last night, they're saying the results of this fact-finding investigation will not be released to the public. Do you think that considering the nature of these attacks um, and the accusations towards the UN peacekeepers that this fact-finding investigation and the results of it should be released to the public? Well, first of all, I mean, I think uh, we've spoken to this in uh, detail over the last couple of days, and I know Ambassador Power uh, also issued a very strong statement um, uh, regarding uh, the UN's uh, – uh, or the, the need for the UN to – uh, carry out as quickly as possible an investigation uh, into what happened. Um, you know, I think we're always encouraging transparency in these kinds of reports. Um, but I think what's Im mostly important here, or most important here is that they carry out as quickly as possible this uh, uh, fact-finding uh, review uh, of the incident. 
to determine uh, how to, to ensure this never happens again. Do you need a fact-finding mission to tell you that the UN did nothing to respond when they were told that they, these people, these aid workers, were in need of help? I think always in these kinds of incidents, and again, this was absolutely abhorrent uh, what happened, uh, but I think in, it's always useful uh, to look at, uh, to not draw any broad conclusions, but to look at uh, the timeline of what happened and to understand the decision-making that went into that uh, process. Uh, as I said, if only to make sure that in future uh, uh, cases, uh, similar situations, rather, uh, that this doesn't happen again. Can you say how many Americans were implicated in that attack or were victims in that attack? Uh, I, I don't think we've been able to, to give a precise number, uh, and the reason why is we don't have uh, Privacy Act waivers on all the individuals involved. Um, uh, I'm not certain I have a, 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 a firm number there. I apologize. Well, if there were Privacy Act waivers, that would that there were Americans, right? So there were Americans. We've but we've so you that. can can you say say again a number of Americans, even if you don't have the waivers? Like no, we're not asking for specific information. Just if you're looking for a specific number, or you're saying how many Americans were victims there? I'll see anything? what I can get for you on that. I don't have it in front of me. And uh, also staying in South Sudan. Sure. Uh, the Sudanese government has apparently rejected the UN Security Council resolution for further troops. Um, do you have any reaction to that? And uh, does it, what's, what's the next step if indeed they do reject? You're talking about, uh, sorry, South Sudan? Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, Su Sudan. Sudan, yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Get mixed. Um, so, uh, and I apologize. The question again, I was trying to look for the figure that, uh, that Justin had asked for. I apologize. Can you just give me the question one more time? Um, so uh, there was a UN Security Council resolution, I think a few days ago, I don't know if my colleagues can help me with that, that, uh, that authorized a, a new set of troops uh, to go in. And uh, the government has rejected that. I think it was, it was South, South, South Sudan. Sudan. Sorry. Yeah, this is South Sudan. Sudan. That's why I was confused. Yeah. Well, we do support the deployment of a regional protection force uh, under the auspices of UNMIS, uh, and that was authorized, as you noted, by the U.S. Security Council on August 12th to help restore and preserve the stability in Juba. Um, so uh, uh, we want to see that, uh, that U.S. Security Council uh, resolution adhered to. Um, you know, such a force, uh, we believe, needs to be able to ensure uh, free and safe movement in Juba, as well as the protection of uh, vital infrastructure. Uh, and we have supported the region's request uh, in calling on the government of Sudan, South Sudan rather, uh, to accept the deployment of this force for the purpose of restoring stability and for the purpose of reestablishing a level of normalcy uh, and stability for the people. Stay in South Sudan. Yes. Uh, since uh, um, South Sudan soldiers are responsible for the attack on July 11, is the State Department considering taking additional sanctions against uh, South Sudan leadership? And uh, what do you respond to Human Rights Watch, uh, who pressed you again to, uh, to impose an arms embargo on, on, on the two parties? Sure. I mean, I don't have anything uh, particular to, uh, to announce in terms of additional sanctions. We might, uh, you know, we uh, obviously, uh, you know, want to see both sides in the conflict. Uh, or all sides rather in the conflict uh, cease their violence uh, so that, as I said, uh, some kind of stability and, no and normalcy can, can return to, uh, um, to the uh, situation on the ground. Um, uh, and that means uh, as well as uh, – um, I, I believe there was – we saw today just a, there was an announcement uh, to hold early elections. Uh, uh, by uh, Kier, and uh, that's obviously of great concern to us as well, um, because it, it is once again a, a unilateral action that's in violation of the letter and the spirit of the, the peace agreement. So what we want to see, again, is both parties uh, uh, stop the violence and work on 
uh, adhering to the peace agreement. Yep. Uh, and this is the last question, guys. You've had me up here for more than an hour. Sure thing. Um, the consulate in Lagos, uh, or the issue, um, just, I know I spoke about this on Monday, but I just wanted to see that if, I know that a requ uh, determination has not been made, but in terms of how many locations are being considered, and was there any uh, concern about the optics of this request coming so soon after the Secretary Clinton left office um, that it almost seems like it might have been waiting for them to leave office before the request was made. You're talking about the request for the consulate? Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I thought we addressed this last week um, pretty extensively. You know, we've not, uh, as of today, uh, contracted or acquired any property uh, for a new consulate in Lagos. Uh, or Lagos, rather, you know, we have over the past several years identified and looked at and evaluated multiple properties. Uh, we've had conversations uh, about multiple pop property with their, their property owners and their representatives uh, because we're looking, as we've noted, to acquire property for a new consulate in, in Lagos. And this process is uh, in no way connected to or subject to uh, individual preferences or pressure. It's run out of uh, the overseas building operations. Uh, it's managed by career real estate professionals, and they evaluate uh, potential properties uh, under consideration uh, before any uh, property is put under contract. So just to clear the air here, this is a process that is followed not just in Lagos, but throughout the, uh, the world when we're looking at acquiring new properties for either consulates or embassies. And, uh, you know, as I said, in Lagos, there's, um, there was no deviation of that process, from that process, rather. Is that it, guys? Thanks.